Ed here with the Digital Digest, and today I wanted to share a quick update on the Sony FX3 and FX30, because as of today, April 12th, 2023, Sony has rolled out uh, brand new firmware for both cameras. Now, I don't own the FX30, nor have I reviewed it, so that will not be part of today's video, but of course the FX3 is my A camera uh, for the channel, and I've been using it pretty much since launch, since I reviewed it, essentially, and the feature updates that it got today are very significant. So first and foremost, Sony uh, with version 3.0 of the firmware added a DCI 4K. Now, this is one of the chief reasons that many of you out there felt that it did not, it being the FX3, deserve to be called a cinema line camera. It was simply because it didn't support cinema 4K. And I completely understand and in many ways agree with that. If you go back to my coverage of this camera when it launched, it was something that, of course, I pointed to like everyone else on planet Earth. Uh, so that's already a huge uh, bonus to anyone that already owns this or is potentially shopping it. Nothing to dislike there. And I'm excited to start shooting in DCI 4K. Now, I have not updated the firmware yet, so I can't tell any of you what the experience is like or operation. You know, Sony always claims it's more stable. We'll see. In addition to that, uh, other critical things... Uh, focus breathing compensation is now present on the FX3, as is anamorphic de-squeeze. So for anyone that's been waiting uh, for either of those features, I think this is a huge update. I mean, if we got one of these things, if it was just the DCI 4K, I think so many users would be happy, but then there is more. In addition to that, the FX3 also got some new shutter speeds. Uh, so we've got a 48th as well as I believe a 96th. So in S and Q, you've got basically a new photographic tool that's going to give you a lot more uh, flexibility. Uh, one thing that many of you will critique though on that note is that we do not have a shutter angle. So this is something that I believe Sony can address and likely will because it's pretty much a necessity at this point uh, given these feature updates because now not only is the FX3 truly a cinema camera, I mean, with something like a shutter angle, I think there are many of you that would start to make the argument that you'd prefer the FX3 over its larger siblings. Not all of them, but certainly some of them. And even though it doesn't have an ND filter built in like the FX6, remember, it does support uh, 4K 120, something I believe some of the older siblings, the much more expensive ones, do not support. So the FX3 was already dynamic. It's become even more dynamic. And for those of you that own the A7S3 that are saying, well, what about us? I wouldn't be so sure that Sony is going to leave the A7S III out of the party, uh, just like the A1. Many users are now uh, doubling down on the ideology that they think Sony is going to abandon uh, firmware updates that are pivotal and crucial to the A1 and A7S III, and I totally disagree. Look, this is a two-year-old camera. It's a little bit younger than the A7S III, but we're working with all the same hardware. The body is really the difference in the fact that the A7S III has an EVF, whereas this, of course, has an XLR adapter that you are paying for. And while many of you wish that the FX3 had a model that didn't include the XLR adapter in order to get that price down, it's part of the cinema line. So that's just apparently not going to happen. Now, as we know, the A7S III, not a cinema camera. So while some of you may already feel like that's a legitimate reason for Sony not to update uh, the firmware with any of these features, I would make the argument that as long as it is still in production and it's, it's still you know, holding a retail price point, which it is, it has not gone down in price, there is really no reason for Sony not to continue to make it compelling and competitive, and that's where firmware can help. Of course, uh, this update to the FX3, I feel like is a direct result of the ZV-E1 being announced. That's my opinion, that's not from Sony. And the reason I say that is because, of course, the ZV-E1 does uh, essentially have the same 12 megapixel sensor, uh, much of the same performance. I wouldn't say it has the same autofocus system, but it does have an AI processing unit, which makes it smarter than this much more expensive cinema camera that's literally nearly twice the price of that $2,200 body that will start shipping in May. So I think that in order to ensure that the FX3 didn't somehow become cannibalized or lost in the shuffle, they had to up the ante with what this little dynamo was capable of. And I think it was a very smart move because these are features 
that of course you will not find on the ZV-E1 or even the A7S III, which now makes the FX3 really you know, a one-of-a-kind uh, solution. Now the FX30, I said I'm staying away from that for a reason. I don't use it, haven't reviewed it. As I mentioned at the top of the video, it's just become even more compelling. And you know, it wasn't something that I considered as an A camera for the channel, but who knows, once I review it and use it, it I think will easily earn a B cam uh, award or title simply because at that price and with those features, yes, it's close to the ZV-E1, but I already own an FX3, and to me, that's what the ZV-E1 would potentially replace because in my studio, uh, the FX3 was a perfect fit. It was definitely overkill, and now with these features, even more overkill, but unlike many users, I do use this XLR uh, attachment regularly. Um, every single video I shoot, this is an exception because the FX3 is not recording the content of this video. Uh, another thing you should be aware of is if you plan on shooting DCI 4K, you're going to need one of these, a CF Express Type A card or a V90 SD card. So keep that in mind. If you're interested in, again, unlocking all of the potential of the FX3, you're going to need some very fast uh, V90 SD cards or, of course, a CF Express Type A card like the 160 gig Pro Grade uh, that I have right there, which is what I use 90% uh, of the time. And then, of course, uh, V90s back it up because, after all, 160 gigs, simply not enough. Um, but a lot of things to like here. And the reason I've got the A7R5 in the shot is because, look, it's another new camera. It's been out since the end of 2022 and it brings AI processing, something we can't cram into the FX3, and that's likely what we'll see in the sequel to the FX3, right? We'll get uh, essentially an AI processing unit, hopefully an improved uh, upon sensor, better autofocus, but much of that is going to come with the AI processing unit, and who knows what other features in the realm of 8K or uh, SDI, I don't know. Either way, um, the whole point is, is that as long as Sony's continuing to improve their product, which they always do, Inherently, some of those features will trickle down in a firmware update. Now, you're not really seeing any of that from the A7R5, but the focus breathing is there, and that's something the A1 still hasn't seen, or of course the A7S III, as mentioned. Now, the A1 files into the same category, as far as I'm concerned, as the A7S III. Um, anyone who thinks that the A1 and the A7S III are just going to become forgotten bodies, I don't believe that for a moment, simply because they're flagship, the A1 is the best camera ever made, and it will only be, uh, in my opinion, bested by its successor from Sony. So, yes, Sony isn't going to give us everything that their next camera will possess, but there's no question once they've invested the money in actually giving those features to another model, it's a lot less expensive for them to trickle it down uh, to an older model like the A1 or A7S III as long as they're 100% certain uh, that it's not going to cannibalize the new offerings. And I think that's all that this is really about. And the best example I can give with the FX3 is that when that ZV-E1 was announced and launched, um, I, it did occur to me that it might be better suited to be my A-cam than the FX3, simply because I didn't need all the features the FX3 had. And if I did sell my FX3 and grab a ZV-E1, it would put money uh, in my pocket towards production, among other things, uh, for the, the channel. So uh, I'm not incredibly shocked that Sony did this because, hey, I was already thinking about possibly, you know, giving up the FX3 for the ZV-E1. Uh, so again, not surprised that we now have a lot of the features everyone has always wanted uh, present in the FX3. Now, if all of you are interested in an actual tutorial on installing the firmware update, I am more than happy to do so. Granted, I think it's pretty simple. That's something that sometimes is something that people are excited about. Again, I won't be doing that from a Mac. I'll be doing it from PC, and I think the majority of the users that run into issues generally are working with Macs, which is why going forward, uh, Sony will be using uh, their creator app uh, with this camera and potentially, I would say, all of their cameras going forward to update the firmware. No longer will you have to actually have a desktop PC to update. Now, with this update, we will still need to do it the old-fashioned way, but going forward, Imaging Edge software phased out, Creator app brought in, and with the Creator app, I'm looking forward to this, we'll be able to just, you know, pick up our phone 
and get down to business with updating firmware when we're comfortable to do so. Either way, a lot to like here. Anyone who complains about this update is, I, I don't know, they'll complain about anything is the way that I look at it. Because if any other camera was granted these features through a firmware update, uh, the praise and celebration would be endless, but inherently there are always uh, schmucks in the world, and a lot of them are out there saying now that everything should have been, you know, there at the launch of the FX3. Now, I don't disagree with that, uh, but that's really irrelevant at this point, isn't it? Uh, it's about what is available now and at what cost, and even with this slightly less than $4,000 retail, this camera is still holding up incredibly well, if not nearly perfectly here in 2023, and it's only become more compelling. So yes, we could spend time whining about what should have been when it launched several years ago, or acknowledge the fact that where it stands uh, is still uh, an incredible uh, stature for its price point. And yes, Panasonic, the S5 Mark II is very compelling, but I do not for a moment see myself moving from the FX3 with its bonus features that are really a backbone of a cinema camera to move to something like that. Granted, it is an incredible body. It appears to be amazing uh, at its price point of a little over 2K. That's more aimed, in my opinion, you could start to draw the comparisons with the ZV-E1. The FX3, now with these new features, does feel a lot like it's competing more than ever with the FX6 um, and, of course, more of the FX uh, cameras up the line, especially since, as I mentioned, it's also got 4K 120. Um, there are other things missing from it that, of course, are a limitation of the form factor of this body, but that's not where I begin to uh, become really critical of it. So, FX3, already my favorite video camera. Now, it's just gotten better. Uh, but that pretty much sums things up. Happy I went with the FX3 as opposed to, of course, the A7S III, as I've been mentioning through the course of this video. But, I still wouldn't write the A7S III off, just like I'm not writing off my A1. I believe that a lot of the updates we're seeing in this camera, the focus breathing, uh, compensation, I don't think the, the 4K, uh, DCI 4K is gonna come uh, to uh, the A1, but it wouldn't be wrong. The A1 is the most expensive uh, E-mount camera on the market. Um, so. I wouldn't be shocked if they really did bring the kitchen sink to that camera because after all, it cannot replace the FX3. It overheats. It's not designed specifically for video, even though it's an amazing video camera, uh, in large part thanks to its sensor and autofocus system, that stacked uh, design. But the A7S III, on the other hand, you know, there will probably uh, get an update. I'm not sure that they're going to deliver a DCI 4K there because the cinema 4K, it's not necessary on a camera that's not a cinema camera. And this is where, you know, the A7S III not being part of the FX lineup does bite it in the butt. Uh, beyond that, you know, the focus breathing compensation and pretty much everything else that was added in this firmware update, I could see going to the A7S III. It's only that DCI 4K that I would wonder. And again, that's not a limitation of hardware because the hardware in here is the same as there. It's a matter of it not being part of the cinema line. And, you know, it's ever so slightly older than the FX3, not old enough to not get an update, but... It is less expensive. Granted, that's because it doesn't have this, you know, but it does have a great EVF in place of it and a completely different body style that's really focused more on being a still rather than a video camera when compared to the FX3. So we'll see what happens, but I wouldn't start to cry about the A7S III or the A1, um, especially since this update went, update went to the FX30 as well, an $1,800 APS-C body. Remember though, that is a two month old camera. So that is highly relevant. Marketing and profit motive is still there, but Sony's not trying to make people not want to own their products as part of that line. So pretty much rounds things out. Very solid firmware update. I'm going to get it installed, uh, and then I'll let you know if it actually follows through on all of the huge potential uh, that it offers, at least on paper, in a press release. Any questions or comments, please feel free to post them at that like button. And as usual, please feel free to subscribe and please stay safe. Later.